Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we gather together to worship uh, this morning. After five years of saying that, you should probably be able to quote that directly. That, uh, but we are, as we always say, a praying people. And that goes uh, without saying, but I think also needs to be reminded again for each one of us that uh, our days begin with prayer. And so I ask you to look around the room uh, as God leads and guides and directs your thoughts. If you're watching us online, I ask you to do the same thing that God would lead and guide and direct your thoughts to whom to pray for. Uh, and then after a moment of two of silent prayer, then it'll be my privilege to pray for you. If you're visiting with us this morning, a uh, special welcome to you as well. Father, on this day set aside to rest, this day set aside to worship, to pray and to play and to enjoy the blessings of family and the blessings of our community, the bit of rain this week, sunshine that warms the earth once again, this day when we recognize that the glory of Christ's resurrection occurred on the first day of the week, and so we gather on the first day of the week in recognition of that, to recognize what that means for our days, for all the days to come. So thank you, Father, that we can gather, whether we're here or whether we're at home, wherever we are, that your spirit would be present among us. And in Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Just a note, if you do smell, it smells like fire. That's because the furnaces have kicked on for the first time in six months. So you know when that dust kind of settles in your furnace. So the building is not on fire. If there is a fire, please exit. <laughs> no, you're not supposed to shout fire in a crowded theater. I think that's against the law or something. So anyhow, that's the smell you're picking up. It's not, I always, I have a note here that says, don't pick on Murray. And I don't know why that's, why that's written there. But, uh, all right, take your bullets this morning and draw your attention to a few items as we uh, begin part of our community life. This morning, of course, is Communion Sunday. Uh, ladies Bible study, you know, continues on as long as you're able. Okay, Tuesday and Thursday, and I suspect they know that. Club DJ, Dylan, at the school, what time? Luther Church. At the Luther Church, sorry, at the Luther Church at 3.30. 3.30. Wednesday, uh, our Bible study continues at Squirrely Shirley's, and then prayer meeting here at 7 o'clock and Bible study at 7.30 as we continue. Uh, this year, week, we'll be looking at Rosh Hashanah uh, at the Jewish New Year. And then Friday, youth group, Keith, do you want to? Uh, Thanksgiving weekend. I don't believe the youth group. And there's no week, Sunday school this no Sunday. Sunday. That's right, so this is wrong. So no Sunday school this coming Sunday because of the Thanksgiving weekend. All right, sorry, I should, Felicia let me know that, but it's not in here, I'm sorry. Uh, coming events, you'll see a few things there. Uh, men's conference, Dylan, we've got more people are starting to register finally, so that's good news. And then games night here on the 26th. You will as well see a bit of a social committee update on the back and I'll leave that to you. You'll also see, you see a note regarding shelter helps as uh, Keith will be, will be having, hosting a banquet in January. But if you uh, missed the Shelter Help Sunday, please do speak with Keith and you can be updated on that. Uh, and uh, is there anything else I've missed? All right, let's worship through song this morning. I invite you to stand with us this morning. Remember, you want to just mute this while I plug it in, or I'm going to shock somebody. <laughs> Never mind. So, we're going to have the beauty and privilege of leading you in worship this morning. That's my microphone. There we go. Um, you'll probably notice that we're flying one short this morning. So, you can use your preferred analogy of a three wheeled car or a three wheeled stool three-legged stool we uh we can stand up for a certain amount but if you push us too hard we're going to fall over so join in and help us out this morning Fish will be back tomorrow and we're all looking forward to it so <laughs> let's uh let's sing together higher ground
Valerie. Father, I'm reminded that we don't know how to pray as we ought, and yet your Spirit prays on our behalf, in groans and utterances beyond words or beyond circumstances. So this morning, I ask that your Spirit would pray in us, through us, over us, and for us. As we go through our days, whether it's the difficulties of our children and surgery they're facing, difficulties of the age and the surgeries that we're facing, the weariness that comes from hard work, concern about tomorrow for our kids, for our communities, for our country. We think about the upcoming election here in Saskatchewan and south of the border. We think about the war in the Middle East as Israel once again faces her enemies. Ukraine, Russia, places where violence now is a common occurrence. Father, we ask that your sovereign hand, who is working all things according to your good, fulfilling your designs for this life and for ultimately for the next, would be known by our leaders. So we pray for those going to the polls in the days to come, that they would be wise. We pray for the innocent who are being harmed, that they would have the protection of your hand upon them. Father, for each one, we thank you. We think of the plans that we have in these days to come here in this place. And I ask that they would not be ours looking for the God housekeeping seal of approval, but that you would have spoken to us clearly through your spirit and through your word, through the counsel of wise people around us. For our men's conference coming up, as people prepare to speak a word in truth, as men are now being prepared, even by now, by your spirit, to hear that word of truth. For the ladies' outreach is a youth group, the ladies' Bible study, and our time at Squirly Shirley's. These doors you have opened for us in this place, we are so grateful for. Club DJ and others. We ask that we would be in obedience following you through them, not of our own strength and wisdom, but in humility following you. And we thank you now for the blessing upon our days, for the rain that's fallen, the sun that we've known, all these good things from your hand. In Jesus' name. I'll ask our ushers to come forward. Yeah. 
There is. Oh, I'll sit back up. of the Bible, The Last Supper. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. The disciples asked Jesus where he wanted to eat the Passover meal that night. Jesus said, as you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Hello. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, uh, Hi. The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. The disciples found everything to be just as Jesus had said. Later that evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples. They sat down to eat, and Jesus said that he was happy to be with everyone. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. He said, take it, for this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus told them to do this to help remember him. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said to his disciples, This is my blood. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus said, One of you eating with me here will betray me. He told them that things were supposed to happen this way, but that great sadness would await the one who betrays him. The disciples were very upset and asked, Am I the one? Who is he talking about? Judas asked Jesus, Am I the one? And Jesus said, You have said it. One of the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus said it was the one who he would give the bread to. He gave the bread to Judas, and Jesus said, Hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant, so Judas left at once to betray Jesus. Then Jesus comforted and encouraged the disciples. He promised them that they would have a helper come when Jesus was gone. They all sang a song to God together. believe we have junior church or children's church so uh there we go thank you vanessa thank you you can be dismissed try i'll get those lights again thank you Let's pray. Father, lead us and guide us in the truth. Sanctify us by the truth, for thy word is truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Have you ever thought about how you think, not what you think, but actually how that process works? Ask yourself, why am I thinking this thought? Or why do I think this way? Or maybe, what is another person thinking and why are they thinking that way? As we've learned the other, the other day, Dylan and I were talking that sometimes we're not on the same page because we're actually both reading from different books. Um, we're not always thinking that way. Well, if you've taken a minute to do that, I won't ask you to do it now. It is a revealing event about why we think the way we do. Have you ever thought about how you think about Jesus? What thoughts or images come to mind? What was he like as a person? What was he like to spend time with? What was coffee with Jesus like? A lot of our images and thoughts about Jesus come from the pictures or music or the teachings that we received. If you grew up in Sunday school, Jesus is in a white robe with a blue sash, right? Even though he lived in a dry and dusty land. Uh, maybe there was a painting at your grandma's house, one of those praying hands ones, and you thought Jesus or the guy on the door kind of thing. Um, Saddleback kind of gives us a fresh image, and now I can't think of Jesus without going, hello. And it's, it's ingrained in our brains. My thoughts and images of Jesus were shaped by five day clubs, uh, VBS, and of course, Sunday school, Boys Brigade, all those images growing up through the material they gave us. But it was in the 1970s that I discovered movies as a big part of my brain. And I discovered Jesus movies. And my favorite one, the one that I still go back and watch uh, repeatedly, and really is uh, my favorite image, of, well, not my favorite, one of my favorites, is Godspell. And if you haven't seen it, don't worry about it. it it's, it's not really the help. But um, the dialogue from Godspell is the book of Matthew. So it's taken directly from Scripture. But imagine that Jesus was a flower child in New York in 1974, and you'll pretty much get what Godspell looks like. And, uh, I guess I encourage you to watch it. <laughs> but the one we weren't allowed to watch in my household was Jesus Christ Superstar. It came out in 1973, the year before, and that was forbidden. And to be honest, to this day, uh, the images of it don't sit well with me. But one song does. It's sung by Mary Magdalene, uh, the woman whom Jesus cast out demons from. And it's a haunting reflection on her relationship to Jesus. It's about how she thinks about him. And in it, we see her connecting with an image or a portrait of Jesus that I don't think we often do, through no fault of our own. To be honest, I don't think I've ever heard another song quite clearly or actually express her response and her relationship, this image of Jesus. Uh, the song is called, I Don't Know How to Love Him. It's short. I'm not going to sing it. But it's sung by a woman who's used to being in control, and particularly in control over other men and over herself. And she ponders this question of, now who is this whom I cannot control? Uh, a couple of lines from the opening song says, I don't know how to love him. I don't know how to take this. And a few verses later, in a far more poetic form than this, she says, I'm used to being in control, but that doesn't work with him. And then the third last line, she makes this admission. And this is the part I never hear, or we rarely ever hear. She softly sings, he scares me so. He scares me so. See, this is a different Jesus. This is C.S. Lewis's lion. This is Revelation's rider on the white horse. This is the Jesus of Mark's gospel. There is movement and a little bit of danger here. So while Matthew gives us the teacher, the rabbi, and the counselor, Luke gives us the healer, the, the compassionate one, the ministering to lepers and women calming the sea, delivering the demonic and feeding the 5,000. John gives us the, the mystic. He is the gateway to the new birth, the cryptic teacher. Where I am, you cannot find me. I and the Father are one. It is Mark who gives us a Jesus unlike these other three. Here in Mark, Jesus moves quickly, immediately. His first miracle after coming up out of uh, being the wilderness is not a wedding, but it's engagement. He says to the people around him, the kingdom of his God is at hand, repent. Here, Jesus heals on the Sabbath and breaks the law. He confronts the demonic. He turns to his disciples and says, you so lack understanding. He tells the teachers of the law, you don't understand the law. There's a 
I wouldn't say abrasiveness, but a confrontational nature to Jesus in Mark. And so turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 1. It's only two verses, and that's why we didn't read it. They would come up, read, and be down. But it starts in verse 12. Last week we looked at his baptism. Mark chapter 1, just two verses, 12 and 13. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Mark chapter 1. Verses 12 and 13. And it says, And immediately the Spirit brought him out into the wilderness. That word brought doesn't convey the power of the word. The word is cast or throw. It's the same word that Jesus uses in driving the money lenders out of the temple. He drives them out of the temple. In, in the Septuagint, and don't worry if you know that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew, it's the same word that the angels drive Adam and Eve out into the garden. This time the Spirit drives him, not into the world of men, but into the wilderness. So this morning, come with me into the wilderness. Come quickly. For here in the wilderness, Jesus is not camping. He's confronting. And here in the wilderness, first he confronts his humanity. Then he will confront his history. And then he will confront his adversary. He confronts his humanity, his history, and his adversary. Let's just read those two verses. Verse 12, And immediately the Spirit brought him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, or the beasts, and the angels were serving him. Just a little bit of framework so you have an understanding of what this wilderness is. Uh, this isn't the desert of Egypt when you think about the rolling sand. It's, it's more like the Badlands of Drumheller. I suspect most of you have seen that Badlands. And there the early spring rains come and it's green, but by summertime, the heat turns it all to brown. And at that time, it was the home of, we know from records, leopards and ravens and vipers, lizards and foxes, gazelles, bears and wild oxen. It was a place of wild beasts, a lot like the prairies were here 150 years ago. Imagine going there. It's not a hospitable place, rich in abundance. And it's here in this inhospitable, barren, dangerous world that Jesus has his three confrontations. The first thing he does is he confronts his humanity. He confronts his humanity. In other words, before exercising power over others and ultimately over all things, he exercises power over himself. He takes dominion, as it were, over himself. As Jesus would later say in Matthew 16, if any man would come after me, let him learn how to say no to himself. We must be masters of ourselves. And he demonstrates this by fasting for 40 days. Now, Keith alluded that Felicia's gone, and Donna's been gone this weekend. I can't say I'm fasting, but I'll tell you, Pop-Tarts aren't the same as what she normally makes. And so after 30 years of a simple life of family and work and faith, Jesus is about to embark on three years of public life, this great confrontation, and here in the wilderness, he brings his humanity under control. He denies its most basic desire and need, food. I went to the Mayo Clinic and asked that very question, and here's the answer roughly, which was much longer, but here's what the Mayo Clinic says about fasting for any that length of time. After about three to five days of fasting, the body starts breaking down fat in order to produce energy. Here's the quote. When that happens, the liver is reduced to breaking down fat instead of the usual glucose, and it produces ketone bodies, a toxic byproduct. If it's left untreated, the buildup can lead to, here's where I'll struggle, diabetic ketoacidosis. That sounds good, doesn't it? You're, the nurses are tracking. Basically, it says, untreated, this will lead to death. In other words, after three weeks or whenever you lose 18% of your starting weight, everything gets worse, to quote, far worse. The body tries to compensate for lack of food by slowing down its metabolism, entering starvation mood, mode. Once fat stores are depleted, the body has no choice, but as the author put it, to mine the muscles and vital organs for energy. The person fasting wastes away as the body consumes itself. Forty days is the verge of death. So he confronts his own humanity and shows control and authority over his own humanity. Secondly, Mark includes an odd little note 
He says he was with the wild beast. Matthew, Luke, and John don't include this. Only Mark includes this note. Now, there's speculation about why this is included. One author says Jesus' peaceful coexistence signifies his authority over him, exercising dominion. That's implying that it was a peaceful coexistence. Another person says that wild beasts are the imagery or the names for demons in the Old Testament, and so now he's dwelling in the land of demons. Fair enough. Another author says this illustrates his second nature as Adam, where Adam lived in a garden of abundance and the animals served him. Here, Adam goes, the second Adam goes into the wilderness. We'll see where that lands. Or possibly it is simply a further description of the hardships he faced, starvation and the threats around him. My thought is simply this, that the inclusion of the wild animals is an illustration that Mark is using of the dangers and the nature of dwelling in the wilderness. Here there is no food and no safety. He fasts all the while around him, wild animals are prowling. So imagine with me this morning. Tomorrow you pack up your vehicle and you head out to Drumheller, but it's 500 years ago in those badlands. There's no buildings or supplies or services around you. No food, no shelter, you could, no backpack, no sleeping bag. You just head off to the wilderness of Drumheller. No way to defend yourself, no firearm or protection. And now you've been camping for two weeks in that wilderness, and you're starting to get hungry. Now remember, the surf, this is a, in the middle of the world. The sun rises about 7, and 12 hours later it sets. So for day after day, in 12 hours of darkness, you lay there, and you're hungry. What goes through your mind at 3 a.m. when you're starving? I know I want to get up and snack, right? He doesn't have that option. Here in this wilderness of darkness and wild creatures, Jesus confronts human fear and human need. And he shows his dominion over it. In the wilderness with the wild beasts, he fasts for 40 days. Just a note here, by the way, circumstances don't imply favor or blessing, and they don't determine it. Jesus was in a difficult circumstance, but it was God's will. That's just a side. Secondly, he confronts his history. First his humanity, then his history. Here in the wilderness, he goes to undo and to do. He go goes to undo what Adam did and to do what Israel did not do. He goes to undo what Adam did and then to do what Israel could not do. Here he is Adam confronting temptation. Here he is Israel in the wilderness. First off, he's Adam. He undoes what Adam did. The first Adam fell in the garden. The first Adam names the tame beasts. The first Adam is driven out into the world of weeds and there finds death. This second Adam, as Jesus is called, now fasts in the wilderness, not the garden. He is with the wild beasts, not the domestic beasts, and he triumphs over adversity. Here, the second Adam has been driven in rather than driven out. And he walks out and feeds the poor and gives life where the first Adam was driven out into the wilderness and finds death. So you see a series of contrasts here. Where Adam had everything and fell into temptation, Jesus has nothing and succeeds. Where Adam's actions brought death, Jesus' actions bring life. He is the second Adam, but he's victorious. Secondly, he is Israel in that he does what Israel did not or could not do. We have to note that in Exodus 4, Israel is seen as a person. It's personified. Thus you shall say to Pharaoh, thus Yahweh says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. That's an interesting phrase, eh? Israel is my son, my firstborn. Sounds familiar? So Israel then goes through the water and into the wilderness before they can get to the promised land. Jesus goes through the water into the wilderness before bringing in the promise of the covenant. Moses fasts for 40 days. Exodus 34, 28. So there he was with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. So we see Jesus as a, uh, Moses as a type of Jesus. Jesus as symbolizing or personifying Israel. And now in the wilderness, where Israel was tested and failed to obey, and failed to obtain the blessing, 
Jesus as the true Israel, the beloved son, my only begotten, amazing parallel with Exodus 4.22. He does what Israel did not do or could not do. He overcomes the temptation. It's how he does it that leads us to our third point. He overcomes the adversary. He overcomes his humanity. He overcomes his history by being the true Adam and the true Israel. And now he overcomes the adversary. Now I want you to notice if you read that, Mark doesn't include much of what you're familiar with. The, the phrasings of the temptation. Those are included in uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4. We'll have to jump in there to solidify and expand these images. What we find then, when the devil comes to tempt Jesus, the last Adam, and the true Israel... He did so with temptations where, that he had done the same ones in the garden with the first Adam and with the same ones that he does with Israel in the wilderness. So this image is, is wrapping itself around the, the person is the same Adam and Israel is Jesus. And the temptations of that Adam suffered, that Israel suffered, that Jesus suffered. So we see the, the both literary style but also the significance of the event. Jesus was tempted with the lust of the flesh. Verse 3 of Matthew 4. And the tempter came and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He's tempted with the lust of the eyes. In verses 8 and 9, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, All these things I will give to you. He showed him, If you fall down, worship me. And he tempts him with the pride of life. In verses 5 and 6, the devil took him along to the holy city at the pinnacle and said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. So he tempts him with lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. So how did Jesus overcome the temptation? If you've been in church long enough, you've probably heard sermons on using the word, and that's exactly what he does. But what word does he use? See, the word he uses is tied significantly to Israel. Because the words he used are the same tools Israel had. He didn't assert his deity and dominion. He used the exact same tools that Israel should have used and could have used to overcome the enemy in the wilderness, but didn't. To the first temptation of the bread, we get a quote from Deuteronomy 8.3. In order that you make you understand that man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live on everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Israel knew that. The second temptation is, here's your kingdom. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to a test as you tested him at Massa. Back to Israel in the wilderness. And the third test, where you throw yourself down, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, 13. You shall fear only the Lord your God and shall worship him and swear by his name. Each answer comes from Deuteronomy. He used the same words, effectively the same weapons, that Israel had that Israel failed and couldn't overcome, he uses the same tools. It would have been one thing to overcome the enemy with greater weapons and say, well, I did what Israel didn't do. And they say, no, no, that's not fair. You used better tools. It's like comparing a player today with a player of 50 years ago. We have better training and better equipment, better coaching and, and better venues. But you know, can you take today's player and put them back to 1960? And see how they would do with those old skates and those straight sticks and no helmet and old ice. Could they succeed as well? We say, well, it's not a fair comparison. We have better equipment now. And for Jesus to use better equipment, Israel could say it's no fair. Jesus says, no, no, I played with the same skates. I used the same stick. I came, overcame with the very tools you had. See, in order to succeed where Israel failed, this new Israel uses the same tools as the old Israel. You don't live by bread alone, you don't put the Lord your God to the test, and you worship him only. <laughs> Luther was right when he said, our temptations are often our teachers. And as Spurgeon simply wrote, learning to say no will be of more use to you than learning to read Latin. Not bad. And so, Jesus took what Israel should have taken. The truths of God's word that they had in the wilderness, that word of God that they possessed, and he did what Israel should have done with those same tools. He overcame the temptations of the evil one and the witness. He is the true Israel. He did what Israel did not do, overcome temptations with the word. He undid what Adam did do. 
His obedience brought life, undoing the death consequences of Adam's disobedience. In the face of everything, Adam failed. In the face of nothing, Jesus succeeded. With only the tools at hand, Jesus succeeded with the same tools Israel failed. Jesus came into the wilderness to regain the garden temple paradise. He begins by overcoming in the wilderness and ends his life by leaving the garden tomb. And it says, and simply as Mark records it, and the angels attended to him. This is another reference to Elijah. It's a quote or a reference or an allusion, rather, to Psalm 91. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. That's the one that Satan quoted. You shall tread upon the lions and the cobra, the wild beasts of Mark, and the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Right, let's get this to land. Compelled by the Spirit, Jesus comes up out of the water and goes into the, the wilderness. And there he confronts his own flesh, and he demonstrates self-control at an unprecedented level. As Paul would later instruct us in Titus, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodly and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. One of the signs of the presence of the Spirit in our life is self-control. Jesus demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit. He confronts his history where Adam and Israel failed in the garden in the wilderness. Jesus succeeds with the same tools. He fulfills all righteousness. He just said that early on. Mark proves it here in the passage. And he confronts the adversary. And they are exhausted, as we know from AA, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Tempted to take shortcuts to fulfill the Father's designs. He overcomes the adversaries and with a few small rocks, he cuts the giant down. So this morning we ask the simple question, where is the gospel in this passage? Where is the good news? The word gospel is a, a derivative, or it comes from an old English word called Godspell. The God, the good, the spell, the story. It simply means the good story. So I have to answer the Godspell question with a little bit of Godspell. For here in the wilderness, where the soul battles Satan, where ravenous beasts howls and ravaging hunger growls, the good news is reflected back in 1974, back in Godspell. And there's one song there, and it asks the question of Jesus. They turn to him, and they look at him, and they sing, When wilt thou save the people, O God of mercy, when? The people, Lord, the people. Not thrones and crowns, but, but men. They cry out, O God, save the people, for thine they are, and thy children are thy angels fair. Save the people from despair, God save the people. Who is going to save the people, God's spell asks. That question has been asked time and time again. Uh, you might know the poet John Keats. If you don't, don't worry about it. But as John Keats's life was coming to an end, sick and racked with pain, he writes to his friend Charles Armitage Brown, and one little portion from the letter, Keats asks this question. Is there another life? Shall I awake and find all this a dream? There must be. We cannot be created for this sort of suffering. Sadly, Keats would die a few days later at the age of 25. The answer to Godspell's question, to Keats's question, and to, I think, honest questions, comes from the Judean wilderness. Starving, worn, and weary, you'd imagine, 40 days and 40 nights without food, fasting. In this horrific place, he comes almost like Jonah, another type, fresh from the battle. And to the ancient temple, he says, I and the Father are one. And they take up stones to kill him. As he's being betrayed, or at the night he's being crucified, the great emperor, the great governor of Rome, turns to him and says, Who are you? 
What is this kingdom you serve? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And if it were, he would send 10, 000, 10 legions and we would burn your empire to dust. And they nailed him to the cross for treason. And to those who would harm a child, Jesus answers, you know, if you're going to do that, you're better off to go outside, put an anvil around your neck and jump off the pier. And to those who worked and suffered, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What is the answer to Keats's question? Well, maybe it's a little simple. But the answer is Jesus. The answer is his victory over sin and death to do what Adam couldn't do to give life, to do what Israel failed to do to keep the blessings of the covenant and make them available to all humanity. His life, his death, his victory is the answer. I know that perhaps sounds simple, but it's layered in his life. And today we answer as a church the same question the same. Out of the weariness of farm and family and field, we go out into our communities. We weary not in doing good. We proclaim that there is forgiveness and hope and life and community and healing for those who repent. And to a world in fear and suffering, we stand and we proclaim for I consider that the suffering of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in, that, in us. See, Jesus went in the wilderness with the beasts and found out that in the wilderness there was more than just beasts. There was a spiritual reality. And he overcame. We go into a world of life and stuff and things and we proclaim to a world that there's more than just this flesh. That there is a greater spiritual reality. And there is life in him. And so this morning we take communion, this great symbol that there is more than this just cup and drink and bread. It is a spiritual reality, his body broken, his blood poured out. And I got to thinking about communion this morning. Last week I mentioned that baptism was a symbol, an outward symbol to people. It, it defined kind of who, what team you're on. And I want to put to you today as a follow-up, this second ordinance of the church parallels the same way. Uh, communion's many things. But it is in part a declaration to the spiritual realm and the physical realm whose team we are on. And, and here's uh, perhaps an odd illustration for communion, but I, I think it should play with most of you. I want you to imagine you're in Calgary. It's the playoffs between Calgary to Edmonton as if that other happened, but when it does, and you're there in this sea of red all around you at the mall, and you're wearing blue and orange, and they look at you and go, oh, you're one of them. You're on that team. When we take communion, we basically are declaring to one another and to the realms that we cannot see that we're one of them. We're on that team. We are on Team Jesus, so to speak. And so this morning I invite, as a declaration of your relationship with Jesus, to share the Lord's table with us. Elders, I'd like to invite you to come forward. Paul writes to the church, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. Heavenly Father, as we come before your table this morning, uh, we remember your body that was broken for us on our behalf. And Lord, we know that all have sinned and fallen short, uh, but you were willing to take those sins on your shoulders uh, to make a way that we could come before the Father clean. And so we thank you. Amen.
To you this morning, Jesus says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Father God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you um, that even now, though while we're still enemies of yours, you sent your son to die on the cross for his body to be broken and his blood to be shed. I thank you that through this you've made a way for us to be reconciled to you. And I pray that through our observance of this and the realization of this, that you would bring about um, remorse in our hearts for the sins that we committed against you and that you would soften our hearts, that we would be inclined towards you to, um, to turn around from our ways, our ways that are against you, um, the things that we have done to put you on that cross. And so I pray that from that, um, that remorse, we would, we would desire to repent, that we would desire to turn around and head away from our old ways and towards you, that we might be reconciled to you. And we thank you for this great love that before we accepted it, you offered it to us, and that's an amazing thing. So we thank you for your shed blood, blood on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. This cup is the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Do this often as we drink it in remembrance of him. At the beginning of Corinthians, Paul asks a curious question. He says, we preach Christ crucified. The Jews look for signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach this strange thing, that the answer to lawlessness and suffering is a broken man starving in a Judean wilderness. The gospel's message is the strangest thing, that in brokenness we find wholeness, in giving we find life, and in death we find forgiveness. It is the strangest thing, but it is good news for all people. Let's pray. Father, I pray for a humble church. I pray for humble hearts that out of our own brokenness, which we confessed, that the gospel would live and grow, that people would not see arrogance or pride or 
contention or strife, violence. And people would see the peacemakers, the poor in spirit, the hungry. And in that they would see too that there is life and hope. So I pray through our own brokenness and through our own repentance, we might find life and life abundantly to share with a crying and dying world. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Last time we uh, didn't do this, but just to remind you again that after Communion Sunday, uh, we'd like to pray for you. And so if there is a need in your life, whether it's physical, emotional, or whether you don't want to share it with anybody, but you just need to get prayed for, I invite you to stay behind and sit. Our elders and their wives are uh, sensitive, and so women, if, if there's an issue, you say, you know, I'd rather not share with, with, a, with a guy, I get that. And we have good wives who will pray for you with discretion and understanding. Uh, and for men, we can pray with you with boldness and courage. So the rest of you I ask to, when we're done the benediction and the song, to go have coffee, visit, socialize, but if you do need to be prayed for after we leave, I'll give the benediction, and that's your cue. Just stay in your bench. Uh, we would love to pray for you. And we'll go from there. Let's sing. Well, I invite you to stand as, as we close out this morning. Uh, I can't think of a better way to, to follow up Dan's message there than with there's power in the blood. Now may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ through his vicarious death on the cross for all your sins. God bless.